title of our message again is I Believe. Uh, this is part four. When I started this, I thought it was just going to be one message, but um, it has gone on. Now we're at number four, and as far as I can see, there'll be at least two more, if not three more, uh, lessons to go through. Our text is Mark, the ninth chapter, verse 24, and we're just extracting two words from that text, I believe. Last week, if you will recall, we looked at the scriptural foundation of the Apostles' Creed. And we saw that this creed is not just a bunch of doctrinal statements or rules that were thrown together. Each statement in the creed is backed up by at least one New Testament text. And these texts are facts. And it is upon these facts that the Christian religion is based. We saw that the Apostle Creed speaks of the Trinity, the Incarnation, salvation, the church, and the resurrection of the dead with the final judgment following. These things are very important for us to know and for us to also share with other people to inform them about Christianity. As I said last time, it is not enough just to be able to recite the creed. It's not enough just to be able to recite the entire Bible. To be saved from sin and brought into a relation, right relationship with God, we must obey the facts stated in the Creed. In this lesson, I want to begin considering how the statements of the Creed are essential to salvation. We've seen they are scriptural, and we have made statements before they are essential to the Christian faith, to a salvation. And I want to look at them and understand why they are important to our salvation. Now, I will not go through these statements individually as I did last time, but instead I will discuss the facts to which these statements refer. Now, before discussing any of these facts, I want to read a short passage from D.O. Teasley's booklet, Rays of Hope. It touches on what we're going to say. The New Testament is the Christian's creed and articles of faith. The New Testament is spoken of as faith because it is a written expression of what the first Christians believed. They did not believe it because it was written, for they believed it before it had been written. It was written because they believed it. Quoting, These are written that we in turn might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we might have life through his name. End quote. The New Testament is an expression of those principles <coughs> of the Christian religion first taught by Jesus Christ and believed by his disciples and afterwards taught by the disciples and believed by all who accepted Christ, therefore called the faith once delivered to the saints. The New Testament is, in fact, our creed. We have seen that all of the statements of the Apostles' Creeds are, are based on the New Testament. We have also seen that these things were what the first Christians believed. And this is obvious because, number one, they are taken from the New Testament. Not some church confession or anything else, but they're taken from the New Testament. And we've also found some extracts of creedal statements that are included in the New Testament. The reason it is called the Apostles' Creed is not that it was written by the Apostles or any of the Apostles, but because it was based on the things the apostles taught the first Christians. It is clearly an abbreviated statement of the faith once delivered to the saints. The first fact we want to consider is the fact of the Trinity. The Creed makes statements, I believe in the Father, 
I believe in the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Trinity of God. And the Trinity of God is, is an important fact. And we cannot be Christians without believing that fact. Now, I will be the first to admit that the Trinity is not an easy concept to understand. <clears throat> fact is, there is only one God. But the one God exists in three distinct persons. We who believe in the Trinity are often accused of polytheism or tritheism by people that reject the Trinity. But my friends, it is not three gods. It is only one God in three persons. Again, to some people's thinking, that's contradictory, but that's the way it stands. We speak of God using the personal pronoun he as of one person. God is a he. But each person of the Godhead is a he individually and apart from the other persons of the Godhead. They have a distinct identity, one from the other. Yet it takes all three individual he's to be the he who is the one God. Again, that's not easy to comprehend, but it is the truth. The Trinity is the very nature of the person of God. And this is something that is the foundation of understanding the Trinity. It is the very nature of the person of God. It is who He is, and it is who He has revealed Himself to be. The Trinity is not some doctrine that theologians thought up. The Trinity is the way God has revealed himself in the creation and to mankind. And because he is a Trinity, because he is a Godhead, there is an order within the Godhead, and this order is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the fact that there is an order does not indicate hierarchy or that there is an order of superiority over the other persons of the Godhead. In other words, the Father is not more God than the Son, and the Son is not more God than the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that the Father is more important than the Son or the Holy Spirit. There's not a hierarchy. You know, we have like vice president and, uh, I mean president and vice president, an assistant vice president, that's a hierarchy. And you know, when the president's not there, the vice president takes over and so forth like that. That's not the way the Trinity of God works. It is not a hierarchy. But the Trinity indicates an order that is in God. And this order is the order of function. A function. In other words, what each person of the Godhead does as the one God acts. Any act of God involves the entire Godhead. The Father does not act on His own independently of the Son of the Holy Spirit, nor the Holy Spirit independently of the Father of the Son. God acts as one God. God always acts as the Godhead. But each person of the Godhead has a specific function that is necessary for there to be the one God and for the one God to interact with His creation. And this is seen in the very first revelation of God in the Bible, which also happens to be the beginning of our universe in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, where it is written, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. 
and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. This is the opening of the Bible. It is the opening of creation. It is the opening of time as far as we are concerned. And in this opening, we see God as the Godhead. We see the Trinity of God. Now, the word God here is the Hebrew word Elohim, which is a plural word. <clears throat> Excuse me. Although God is mentioned here, the Godhead is represented by the person of the Father. He's not specifically called the Father here. He's just called God. So we see the first person of the Godhead being introduced to us. God and the Father are words used interchangeably throughout the Scripture. In John 3.16, the Bible says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. We could say the Father so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. For there to be a begotten Son, there has to be a Father. And the Father of the begotten Son is God. So we see the Father and the Son here, but yet because the word God is used, it also implies the Godhead. That in the beginning, uh, of the Son, there's also the presence of the Holy Spirit. So there are not just two persons involved here, even though God and the Son are mentioned. In reality, the Trinity is involved in this. Now you might be scratching your head and say, I'm confused. Again, I said, the Trinity is not easy to understand, to comprehend. But it is the way that God has revealed Himself. And when God works, no person of the Godhead works independently of the others. So in the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Then we see that God said, God spoke. The expression, God said, represents the Word of God, which is also known as the Son. Okay, we just said that God so loved the world that He gave His own begotten Son. God spoke, and this Word of God is the Son. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we read, In the beginning was, who? The Word. Well, we said, uh, in the beginning, God. Well, in the beginning, the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things are made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. So here we see this Word. He's not called the Son in this particular passage, but the Word and the Son are one and the same. If you would read through to verse 18, you will see the Word revealed to be Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. So again, these words used interchangeably, Jesus the Son, the Word, God the Father, and we understand that the Son is also God. He is one of the persons of the Godhead. And then Genesis also shows that God, as He spoke, the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of God, was present and hovered over the creation process. The Spirit of God was present in the beginning with God, with the Word, and worked in the creative process that brought about the universe, that about, brought about this world, and my friends, that brought about you. God is Trinity. The Apostle John sums up the Trinity for us 
In 1 John 5, 7, he says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. From God's revelation of himself, we see the functions of the Godhead. We see it in creation. And if we will read the Bible with the thought of the Trinity in our mind, we will see the functions of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit clearly evidenced in the Word of God. The Father wills. The Son expresses the will. The Holy Spirit performs the will. The persons of the Godhead indicate function. It's not one's the boss and the others are the doers. The Father wills the will of the Godhead. The Son expresses the will of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit performs the will of the Godhead. The persons of the Godhead work in consent, uh, concert with each other. And God is always present as Elohim. Keep that in mind as you think about God. Elohim is his true nature, is his true person. That's a plural word. One God who is a trinity. The baptism, oh, let me just say this. There is never any circumstance where one of the persons is present without the others. And in every circumstance, no person of the Godhead is left out. Again, the Father and Son don't work independently of the Holy Spirit. The Son doesn't work independently of the Father and the Holy Spirit. They always work together in everything they do. And the baptism of Jesus shows this to be true. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we read where the Bible says, When he, meaning Jesus, had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And since this voice called him Son, and since the Holy Spirit was descending, who is this voice from? It has to be from the Father. In this event, we see God open the curtain of eternity and give us a peek into his real nature. This was something important to the Jews of the time because they certainly worshipped Elohim. They worshipped Jehovah. But they did not particularly understand the nature of the Godhead. And it was important at this time in God's dealing with mankind, for God to reveal himself as he really is. Okay? We see the Son in the incarnation of Jesus of Nazareth. Okay? We see the Spirit of God descending in a presence resembling a dove. And we hear the Father speaking. Here we have God revealing himself as Trinity. Here we see the true nature of Elohim, his person, the Son, the Spirit, and the Father. Believing the Trinity is critical to our salvation, and it is salvation which makes us Christians. We must believe in the God who is there. You can't just make up a God and be saved. You know, the Muslims did it with Allah. Allah is not the God who is the Trinity. They deny the Trinity of God. They deny the Son of God. They deny the Fathership of God. 
They can't be Christians. They cannot have a relationship with the God who is there. Now, other religions deny the person of God and substitute gods of their own making. You can't believe and put your faith in gods that are not the true God. You must have a relationship. You must have faith in the true God. The God who is there. Mankind are fallen creatures. Separated from their creator by their sins. And they are spiritually dead. The fall of man was not the will of God. But the redemption from sin is the will of God. God so loves all of his created people that he made a way for us to be forgiven our sins, born anew with spiritual life, and brought into a right relationship with him. That's how much God loves us. When we deliberately rebel against God and sin, God still loves us. And God wills to redeem mankind. God longs to forgive sin. God longs to cause us to be born again and have spiritual life. And God longs for the fellowship of His creatures. This is the will of God. And this will is expressed in the atonement for sin made by the life and death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, we read where it says, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. How much God loves us. And thank God for the Son who became incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth who lived that holy and perfect life, but then went to the cross, became the sin sacrifice for our sins, the whole world's sin, going back to Adam, all the way up to the last person that will be conceived into this world, gave himself a sacrifice on that horrible cross, that we can be forgiven, that we can be saved from our sin. And without sin, we can be born again into the very life that God intends for us. He cleanses us from all sin. So, God wills our salvation. The Father wills our salvation. The Son expressed that will on that cross. And salvation is ministered to us through the work of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 3, verses 6 through 8, Jesus said, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is, what? Born, Born of, the of the Spirit. What a beautiful revelation. God, Elohim, the Godhead, is involved in your salvation. It's not something that Jesus did for you. <laughs> It's what God the Father has willed for you. It is what Christ has expressed through the atonement. And is what the Holy Spirit makes happen in your life. See, you are not made a Christian. You are not saved just because you believe something. You are not saved just because you confess your sins, because you ask for forgiveness. It's because what the Father has willed, what the Son has expressed, that the Holy Spirit makes real in your life. It is the Holy Spirit of God that causes you to be born again. To be born of the Spirit. And you have to be born of the Spirit, made a new creation, to be set free from sin. 
I thank God salvation is much more than just the forgiveness of our sins. Thank God it is a transformation of who we are in the presence of God. Thank God for what He has done for us. Salvation is a work of God in the lives of individual people. When God deals with you, it is not just Jesus. It is not just the Holy Spirit. It is the Trinity. John chapter 14, verses 23 to 26. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And listen to what he says next. And we will come to him. Now, who's we? So far it's the Father and the Son. Okay? And we will come to him and make our, who is our? The Father and the Son. Our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Again, Jesus says it's not my word. I am merely expressing the will of the Father. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But listen. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Jesus is teaching us that when we are born again, when we are saved, the Father and the Son make their abode in our lives through the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. Some people talk about being baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they glory in this. And they worship the Holy Spirit. But keep in mind, it isn't just the Holy Spirit of God. It isn't just the Holy Spirit of God living in us. It is the Godhead. It is the Father and the Son. Jesus says, we'll make our abode with you. How? When the Helper, the Holy Spirit comes. Thank God for that. You know, some, you know, some, some Christians have this idea that somehow God the Father is not really involved in our salvation other than He loved us. Jesus made it all happen on the cross. And the Holy Spirit is, we don't know what. But you see, salvation is the work of the Godhead right. in us. And that He moves into us if we truly have been born of the Spirit of God. Jesus told his disciples, we will come to him or we will come to you and make our abode or our home with you. And that is accomplished through the presence of the Helper, the Holy Spirit of God. On the day of Pentecost, and everybody needs to, 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 to realize this, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit filled the first disciples, the church, it wasn't just the Holy Spirit that came into their lives. It was the presence of the Trinity that came into their lives. The day of Pentecost was the day that the dispensation of God changed. It is the day when the law of Moses came to an end. It is the day when the sacrifices and the temple worship all came to an end. And it was the inauguration of the church, but also the day of grace. It is when salvation changed from faith in the law of Moses and sacrifices to faith in God through Jesus Christ and the help of the Holy Spirit. Under the Old Testament, People had no presence of God in their lives. God lived in a temple, in a tabernacle. But thank God on the day of Pentecost, God, as it were, moved out of that tabernacle and he moved into his church, which is you, 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 
your lives if you have been born of the Spirit of God. It was then, and it is now, this presence of God that caused the disciples to be born again. I know that there's a lot of theological tennis match played, going back and forth, ping pong, <clears throat> when people were born again. But people were not really born again until the day of Pentecost, because you had to be born of the Spirit. You know, some people's theology have people being born again before the day of Pentecost, becoming Christians before the day of Pentecost. That could not be, because this plan of salvation was not given to man until the day of Pentecost. Okay? It is this very same presence of God in our lives that causes us to be born again and made a new creation in Christ. It is this presence that enables the church to live holy, godly lives in Lawton, Oklahoma, in this presence world. The apostles, in the Apostles' Creed, we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, and in the Holy Ghost. This is the first principle of Christianity, the Trinity. We cannot be saved from sin and have spiritual life without the Trinity. Admittedly, it is a difficult concept to understand. But God does not ask us to understand it. He just asks us to believe it. One might say, well, I can't defend the concept of the Trinity to non-believers. You don't have to. It is sufficient to say you believe it because that is how God has revealed himself, even if you can't explain it. So thank God for God. Thank God for Elohim, the God who is there, the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who has so loved us that he's made a way for us to be saved from our sins and brought into a right relationship with him because the Godhead lives in us individually, as individuals, and collectively as the church. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Manifest your presence in our lives and work through.